I'm Ilana Horn, go by Lani. Um, so welcome belatedly to the Cadre DRK12 uh, learning series. Um, today we're talking about partnerships and research. For the second part of the series, we're going to have consultations where you can um, sign up to meet with the panelists on different topics, and we'll send out an email that explains that more in our follow-up after this. And included in those consultations will be Carrie Tsu from um, University of Washington at Bothell. Um, as you can see, uh, our panelists do a number of different kinds of partnership work. So we're trying to kind of cull uh, some of the wisdom that that they have some of the stuff that may not make it to the methods section of a paper, um, but that is really, really crucial for successful partnerships. Part of what motivated uh, this topic for our learning series, we, we do a, a survey of PIs and we find out, you know, what topics are interesting to them and what they want to learn more about and dig deeper into. And there's certainly been a growing recognition of research practice partnerships, not only within the NSF, but um, two of these are screenshots from this one is this one on the um, top right is from the WT Grant Foundation that has a new emphasis on research practice partnerships. And uh, the other one is from the Spencer Foundation, which also has a separate um, funding stream for research practice partnerships. Um, uh, Bill Penuel uh, at CU Boulder. Um, has created a lot of resources online and so on about uh, research practice partnerships. And I also have a screenshot there of um, a book he wrote with Daniel Gallagher about RPPs, as they're sometimes called. Um, so we know that this is an important methodology. It's trying to correct some of the extractive work that researchers have often done in communities where they you know, bring in resources for a short term to create and produce research, but then once the resources go away, the communities are not left um, with able to sustain whatever was built. But there's other kinds of things that RPPs can do as well. Um, historically, research has kind of privileged the knowledge of universities and not um, adequately accounted for the knowledge that communities already have. And some of our speakers will be able to speak to that. And so th there's, there's a different kind of knowledge building that can happen through RPPs. And so hopefully um, you'll get to continue to learn and then maybe we'll see some of you for our follow-up meeting um, for our consultations. Hi, I'm Emily Weiss, and um, it's great that you just mentioned Bill Penwell because he's actually an advisor on our project and has helped us pretty substantively with the um, research practice partnership that we have. And um, as you mentioned when you were introducing us, you were talking about the, the balance between um, or the dynamics between the practitioners and the researchers, and I'm actually going to present on the um, as, as a practitioner myself. And uh, I appreciate having been doctored <laughs> during my um, introduction, but I actually don't have a PhD. And I think it's important to point out that sometimes PIs don't have PhDs because um, we are playing different roles in projects. And, um, and I, I don't have one for the kind of work that I do. So uh, our project is called Improving Practice Together. Um, I work at the Lawrence Hall of Science, which is UC Berkeley's Public Science Center, and our project is a research practice partnership between three institutions, the Lawrence Hall of Science, Santa Clara Unified School District, and Stanford Graduate School of Education. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit into the, the roles that each of our partners play on the project throughout this presentation. So uh, the focus of our uh, our partnership and our project is to adapt, implement, and study a professional learning model and build district capacity to improve science instruction and student understanding. And uh, we mostly focus on argumentation or arguing from evidence and science. Okay. And uh, the target grades that we've been working with are grades three through five, but I think our project is, is pretty broadly applicable as well. So I'll give you our, our genesis story to start out. Um, we began with another project called Practice, and that was a research practice partnership between Stanford and Lawrence Hall of Science, 
we had been using Lawrence Hall of Science had been using a professional learning model with teachers for a number of years in different projects um, to help build up their discourse strategies in classrooms and focus on arguing from evidence as well as that became more prevalent through NGSS and the science framework. And um, we had we had seen that teachers were making all these changes in their practice when we were using this model, but we really wanted to study the model to see if the changes we were observing were, were real changes. So we partnered with Stanford and, um, and they were able to do research to show us that our professional learning model actually was effective, not only in changing teachers practice, so you can see, you don't need to be able to see all the different lines here, but just see that they're going up, that um, from the beginning of the, uh, the professional learning uh, model to the end, teachers improve their facilitation skills and students improve their discourse skills. So those lines are measuring both student and teacher outcomes. Uh, but we actually um, were thinking, you know, hiring an external professional learning provider can be quite expensive, right? A lot of school districts really cannot afford to have an external provider do all of that work, especially in an intensive model that actually results in change. And so we as a team wondered, well, what would happen if um, we worked with a school district to build up their own capacity to implement the model, this professional learning model, and uh, they could use teacher leaders and a district science coordinator, and it would be guided by the district's needs and priorities. So we probably have to adapt the very specific professional learning sessions, but the model might say generally the same. And so that was where this project started. Um, so we needed to find a partner district. And we had another project happening at the same time called BASI, and that's where we work with a lot of Lawrence Hall of Science and some other partners, work with a lot of school districts around the Bay Area and throughout California to help them develop plans for improvement in science instruction. And Santa Clara Unified was one of the districts working with us on this project, and I happened to be their liaison. And so um, it seemed like the kind of project they might be interested in. Uh, we worked with a vertical team from the superintendent all the way to classroom teachers, everyone in between. And, and they all seemed sort of sold on working on their elementary science instruction as a focus. And so we approached them to see if they'd be interested in trying this out. And so that was how this particular three-way partnership formed. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more background on the project. It's a three minute video that we made for one of the NSF video showcases, but I think it, it shares pretty well an overview of what we're doing together. IPT is a partnership between three leading institutions um, that is really designed to develop customized strategies to allow the district to build teacher leadership and um, expert practice in teaching and learning science, and in particular to take advantage of student discussion and discourse and argumentation to help students learn and understand complex science ideas. So this is a really unusual kind of partnership it's because it's a three-way partnership with a group that typically does professional learning, which is Lawrence Hall, a group that for the most part does research, which is our team at Stanford and a school district. The research team's role is to investigate questions about the project's processes and outcomes related to classroom learning and teaching, to teacher professional learning, and to building district capacity to conduct professional development. We are also studying the partnership work itself. The Lawrence Hall of Science facilitates professional development activities for a first cohort of Santa Clara teachers who will become teacher leaders later in the project. After participating in practice activities and implementing argumentation for a year, this first cohort participates in a leadership development institute to be able to co-facilitate these activities with the hall for a second cohort of teachers from Santa Clara. The teacher leaders will then have the experience to facilitate the professional learning activities for a third cohort with less support from the hall, and then for many more cohorts independently in the future. Santa Clara Unified School District's teachers participate in the professional development activities. Teacher leaders, the science teacher on special assignment, and district administrators participate in decision making about both research and professional development to ensure that all structures and activities meet the district's needs. 
We consider structural changes, resources, and activities that are necessary to reach the project's goals. Giving students the opportunities to argue for a particular idea is extremely valuable, A, in developing their understanding of the idea, and B, in developing their skills at communicating, listening, and engaging critically with their peers. The kids are talking. They are excited to do science in my room. They were really excited. They asked me every science lesson, are we going to do the circle today? <laughs> I agree with Jay Lynn that actually the magnetic field is growing, but I also think that it's actually getting stronger as mm. it grows. My data can prove it because here at one magnet, I got All right, so our project's been going on for a while. Um, our project logo has changed. Our Lawrence Hall of Science logo has changed. <laughs> We've had a lot of things going on. So um, I just wanted to share a, a little overview of the, you know, you got a lot of a, probably a sense of what the project is about from that video. And I, I wanted to share a bit of an overview of our theory of change and then give you a specific example of how this partnership has, has worked together to address some of the, um, parts of our theory of change. So um, basically, we like as I said, or as we said in the video, we started with this practice model of professional learning. Um, they use video reflection and model of instructional practice and, um, and a lot of decomposition of the things that they're seeing and, and go into some of the theory. And uh, the teachers have a summer institute and follow up sessions and things like that. And Basically, what we did is we sat down with the district as a as a team, all three groups together. And I should say our our research team is re really a research and evaluation team, and the evaluators are from Lawrence Hall of Science. But together, uh, we worked to adapt that professional learning model to the district's context. So, it, for example, they're a FOSS district; that's the curriculum they use, and so we we modified the professional learning so it accommodated their specific curriculum. And then um, we were we brought the professional uh, the teacher leaders through the professional learning model, but we also were building up their ability to um, engage others in professional learning. So that building their capacity. And then uh, the goal was for the teacher leaders to be able to uh, um, implement the adapted professional learning program for other teachers in their district so that we would see shifts in teacher practice for the non-teacher leaders as well as the teacher leaders, right? And the teachers would be facilitating student science practices more effectively. And then eventually we'd be seeing these changes in, in students as well, right? So um, we were hoping to see the same sorts of outcomes we saw with the original practice project, but through the teacher leaders leading the effort. So here's our kind of specific example, our process of one process of co-construction. So we needed to design the teacher leadership capacity building experiences, right? And so that first, that needed to start with the identified needs of the district, potential roles for teacher leaders. Like what were we gonna be having them do? Were they just facilitating a summer leadership institute and just you know trying to use the session write-ups that we had? Are they facilitating video reflection, things like that? So um, we worked together to decide what those things were going to be. And then the Lawrence Hall of Science, which was the external professional learning team, we tried to figure out what were the appropriate tools for that to, to address the specific teacher leadership roles. And the research and evaluation team was trying to figure out like, how do we, how do we research this iterative process? And also what are the types of tools and um, both research and evaluation where we can give the real-time formative feedback and summative feedback Feedback that the teams need to do their work effectively. So that's just one example for this particular um, aspect of the project. And so that could get messy, right? Like we started off with um, after the teacher leaders, the people who knew we knew were going to serve as teacher leaders had gone through the professional learning model themselves, or at least a portion of it. We started to work with them around like, you know, big post-its, everybody in the room from all three teams working together to figure out like, what are the things, the skills that you are going to need to you know be able to to engage in and we ended up with a big messy list like this um and then from there we had to figure out well then what are the goals of the re the teacher leadership professional learning experiences that are going to help us to um develop those skills 
I mean, there were a lot of post-its involved in getting to this point of having these very messy posters in a giant conference room and a lot of hours together. So um, eventually we were able to distill that down to this more elegant looking framework where it's just this back and forth of teachers leading other teachers, right? And building their own capacities in their own classrooms, but also developing the capabilities to lead others. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a quick sense of like, now we're going to kind of fly back out to the 30,000 foot view of our whole project. So um, we talked a bit about phase one, right, this initial adaptation and development of the, the model we started with. And in 2017, 2018, we did that adaptation process. And then in our second phase, the teacher leaders went through that process, right, they participated in the summer institute and follow up sessions during the academic year. There's a lot of iteration as we were um, designing those experiences because we were getting the feedback from the research and evaluation team as we went. And then uh, we, we led a um, a leadership development institute for the teacher leaders in that following summer so that they could start to prepare to use a gradual release model to present to their colleagues and and facilitate their colleagues in these experiences and um that was fine it worked out really well and they the teacher leaders actually were able to take on a large amount of that professional learning experience and um it was supported by our team and then we all know what happened next, right? <laughs> so um, we had planned to have them take on much more of a leadership role in the following summer and the following academic year with a brand new cohort of teachers, but then there was COVID and we had a change in district leadership and they also had um, a revisioning and there was a, a new focus on project-based learning. And so all of these things together kind of shifted our focus and so, our original phase four, where we were going to, um, to going to have them release, you know, a little bit more responsibility and have a summer institute that they led on their own. It actually turned into us jumping ahead a bit and addressing a new problem of practice. So we used a problem of practice protocol. We canceled our um, summer teacher institute, but we just had a summer leadership development institute. And that one was really focused on the needs of the teacher leaders to just teach in their own classrooms so that they could support other teachers in the district. Uh, and this would have been our, our uh, phase five <laughs> where we would have moved on to the new problem of practice, but we just did that a little bit early. So I'm not expecting people to read through all of these research questions right here, but I did want to show you that it was we started off with these original research questions that were fairly simple, just looking at what does it look like to adapt this model and hand it off to somebody else and gradually release that to them. Um, and, and how does the teacher and student practice look over time and over the course of these big changes to our project, we needed to shift our research questions just as much as we needed to shift the design of the experiences. So they needed to accommodate this new focus on the shelter in place support we were offering and on the partnership itself. Okay. Um, and don't worry, I'm almost done because I know I'm almost at time. Um, so we, uh, developed a few tools and processes, which I, I think a bunch of you are here to see kind of what, how do you support this? So um, one of the, the things that I think is really fundamental is we all had a commitment to the value and importance of the work. All three teams were really wanted to see this project be successful, but we were all committed to redefining success throughout the project so that it met everybody's needs. Um, we maintained really good communication between all of our partners, uh, including group interviews, on the successes and the opportunities for growth in terms of collaboration and communication. So that allowed us to set up some structures for having ongoing communication. Um, and one of the things we realized is we needed some like opportunities for really quick formative feedback as we were redesigning that, like for example, that leadership institute over the summer, right during the middle of the pandemic. 
And so we research, we created a brokering tool that's actually been highlighted in that handbook I just was was showing you that um, where the, the researchers and evaluators would meet with the professional learning team every morning before we started our um, professional learning experiences for the day. And they'd look at, figure out with us what were the intended learning outcomes for the uh, day. And then they would collect data and uh, throughout the day related to those specific outcomes that we had identified. Um, they'd quickly summarize their feedback for, uh, for the facilitators during a daily debrief. And then they'd also send us an email summarizing their feedback um, as we were in our planning process for the next day. So it was a nice rapid process that allowed us to um, actually change our work and iterate like just as we needed on the fly for something that was rapidly changing. And then uh, we also had weekly meetings where I would say we have probably uh, about um, 50 to 75% of our team checks in each week for these meetings. Um, and there's always representation from all three of the teams. And then we, I think one thing that's really, really important that not every project has is instead of having our project teams work in silos, I mean, we're obviously collaborating quite a bit, but we've had these boundary crossers. So we had, a, we hired a postdoc where that was specifically her role. Um, she crossed between all three of the teams, even though she was situated within the Stanford research team. And then we also had a boundary crosser from the school district, the, the uh, science TOSA for elementary school um, was, uh, she worked specifically within the school district, but she worked very closely with the professional learning team and the um, research and evaluation teams as well. And this is my final slide, just sharing a little bit about some of the wisdom of our practice. Um, so, you know, I think our big takeaways, um, first of all, the, you know, there are a lot of affordances to a, a partnership where you're bringing people together with um, a bunch of different kinds of expertise, right? You can draw on all of that expertise and that's really exciting. And um, we, uh, we also, sorry, I'm trying to move my, my notes out of the way so I can see. <laughs> um, you know, we, we also learned though that the context in which a partnership is established, it's, it's likely to change, right? Like we all need to be ready to adapt to something that whatever comes up and the, the um, pandemic threw all of us for a loop, right? But it also helped us really think about how to be flexible within the project. And, um, I think it forced us to have a reevaluation of teacher and leader needs, like how are we going to conduct data collection and professional learning and what was going to be most valued and have us all think about what would be most valued. Um, and I think the other thing that was really important is just to remember that when we're working on part ships, they involve humans, right? And we're all, we're just really complicated. <laughs> um, and we all exist in these different contexts. And we all have, especially like teachers and school districts, they have very different pressures and priorities and needs and concerns and, and timelines from researchers. Um, so just being aware of those things and, um, and respectful of those things, I think is really, really important. I think that's about it for me. Thank you. Next up is William McHenry. Uh, my name is William McHenry. I'm a professor of chemistry. I'm executive director of the NSF STEM STARS initiative, but equally important, I was the first director of the LS AMP program at NSF and served on many review projects teams that looked at statewide systemic initiatives, uh, urban systemic initiatives, and many other types of partnerships. So I am very familiar with the challenges in developing and sustaining a partnership with K-12. That is not an easy task, and I'm certain NSF has much, many date points on that. Well, STEM STARS involves three historically Black universities, Jackson State University, Xavier University, and the University of Arkansas at Pan Bluff. And I have this little box in here so I can't see it, but that, there we go. And we started out with a fundamental research question and we had some assumptions that we later modified. 
But the uh, fundamental question was, will training STEM graduates via STEM STARS, our initiative, which is gonna be a combination of teacher residence and masters of arts and teacher programs, have a significant impact on the quality of science and mathematics K-12 instruction, teacher efficacy and satisfaction, uh, teacher retention, and student science and mathematics achievement. How do we deal with that and what type of partnership do we implement to make that happen? Obviously it's university K-12 and we pulled in a research center and I'll get back to that. But this is uh, an example of some of the activities that we schedule where teachers or individuals who would like to be teachers were meeting with us to talk about the the profession and how they could become active and how they could excel. So we thought we had a good handle on how to go about uh, achieving some of our goals. We quickly learned that in talking with 23 different school districts, superintendents, and I visited with many of them, I thought, I knew they had a shortage of science and mathematics teachers, but I also knew that someone was teaching science and math to their students. And we found out that there were students, excuse me, there were teachers who were licensed, but not certified in their area. So the superintendents were very straightforward with us. They wanted us to, to take care of some of the people who they thought had good qualities to become excellent teachers, but they did not necessarily have the certification required by states in each area. That was a major shortage. So what we set out to do was this. We wanted to create a high quality, rigorous, rigorous and clinically based science and mathematics teacher preparation program for aspiring science and mathematics teachers. Even if they didn't know they were aspiring science and mathematics teachers, we wanted to make certain that they saw the, the joy the, the opportunities and how they could contribute by being science and mathematics teachers. Uh, number two, we wanted to show that we could recruit, prepare, employ, support an increasing number of diverse, because that didn't seem to be the case when we started in many, if not all the districts, uh, high quality, effective science, mathematics educators in high need urban and rural schools. From my previous experience, I once was assistant commissioner for academic affairs for a couple of states. I knew that the affluent schools could recruit and retain high quality science and mathematics teachers better than those in high need districts. And when the high need districts had great teachers, it would not be uncommon for the uh, affluent schools to recruit from that pool and have proven excellence from the start. So we had to make certain that we had a number, the sufficient number of folks so that all students would have access to these great teachers. We wanted to expand the cyber mentoring network. I established something called a science diversity network many years ago. It was funded by NSF back in the early, I guess, 2000s or maybe in the teens. And we, we're able to show how to develop and maintain partnerships by making certain that all the partners knew the capabilities of the people they wanted to partner with. Instead of asking people to stop, start, uh, uh, gather all the information and send it to me and we'll determine if we can partner with you. We gave all the universities an opportunity to, to uh, produce materials that present their own achievements, their own strengths. So it wasn't such that we had to uh, interfere or delay so many other institutions' progress. And we want to contribute to the knowledge base. That's what NSF requires of just about all. Our focus area for evaluation, we started out with a heavy emphasis on evaluation. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of details here, but we have probably about 20 or 30 different research questions that we wanted to try to address. And based on my prior experience, I knew that if we could address many of these for that most 
we would be doing great. Because when you start dealing with partnerships involving K-12 universities and a research center, change in leadership can have a, a huge effect on what you're able to do. You can, and we'll get into that a little later, but leadership changes at all levels can impact your, your overall implementation plan. But we'll determine how well we implement it. We had a great person for that. Ascertain and document summative uh, impacts and results, identify facilitators and challenges, facilitators, those things. Many were unexpected that made the project work better. Challenges were also in some instances unexpected. Now, I, I guess I won't say much more about this, but COVID in the third year of the project took, I helped us rewrite our plans because things that we wanted to do in videos and films, we do have videos, but it, I may be able to show some of it, but it, it changed things. We had to figure new ways of producing and new ways of recruiting. And we had promised NSF some things that we were going to do before COVID and certainly we were going to do them regardless of whether COVID hit or not, not necessarily for NSF, but for the students we were trying to serve. So what did we do? Uh, the STEM Stars Initiative successfully recruited 120 students who were enrolled in five different cohorts over six years. And we had to stagger for a number of reasons. And we were able to maintain those students. They obtained their certification. Most obtained Masters of Art degrees. And all of them, whether they obtained a Masters of Art or not, were teaching or are teaching in high need schools. Our goal was to get students, get quality teachers in high need schools, working with the partners who came on board, who were the partners. We had three universities I mentioned earlier. I'm executive director of an urban affiliated, of a university affiliated research center. There were 23 high need schools with shortages of science and mathematics teachers. Uh, they were urban and rural. And this particular group required a lot of uh, hands-on interactions to make certain that um, all the partners understood and valued their roles. What was it? It was a like Masters of Art and Teachers that was modified to, to adopt to a teacher residency initiative and to deal with folks who were licensed in many instances, but not certified, but in some instances who had graduated with a BS degree in a science related area. Most of those areas were, most popular area was biology, of course. Uh, but it was a residency, a one year initiative, a clinical where we had mentors and a community of practice. We had anticipated the mentors coming in during the clinical phase when these folks were teachers or residents. But it turns out that the residency year were equally important to help people stay on track and to know what's required of them and to know the, the quality and the value of a good teacher program. This is just a picture of what we were doing during the residency program. We did not always wear white, but that was one of the initiatives that seemed to call us to follow through because we provided t-shirts and a lot of other things. Uh, the clinical when they would come in, and then the teachers teaching teachers. We wanted them to learn how to sustain their own interest in science by sharing it not only with students, but sharing it with other uh, teachers. And we were amazed. We first uh, uh, system-wide conference dealt with technology, and we had the experts, we thought, in how to teach with technology at that point in time, we were providing iPads to all the students in this project and all of them on campus and on other campuses. Well, we were, we were really doing well. But when we got involved with teachers in K-12 teaching with technology, we found that we had a lot to learn, that they, they knew things and they anticipated things that sometimes the faculty and staff and leaders don't anticipate. So we learn from it, we document it, and we will be publishing it. Uh, how do we get started? We started with the pilot project. 
NSF was gracious enough to grant us a pilot. We looked at it. We tried to determine, well, these things work. Uh, this is what's needed. We said we want to make certain that all our folks are certified before they are in the classroom as teachers of record. They were already, many were licensed, not all, of course. And we wanted to go through the uh, process of identifying what works. And the, MAT, the MAT and the TRA, which is not altogether new, except as it relates to coupling with diversity, worked exceedingly well. And then we talked with our partners as we did from the beginning, and we had structured management. In other words, uh, any of the coordinators, any of the teachers, we had one message that we would carry throughout the three state region. But now we had flexible leaders, uh, superintendents and others. We made certain that we knew that they were there to address the needs and the prospective teachers. We were gonna invest in teachers. And then for some uh, uh, minor consequence, lose that particular investment. So we made certain that we were flexible enough to pull them into our system as well as COVID came in. And that changed a lot of stuff as to how states manage certification and licensure. We had a Harvard, uh, Dr. Emorcia Hill evaluator, and she did a great job. And we had researchers who would go in and take in and design surveys and others. We conducted many surveys of the students and others. From that, we got the model, which I've talked about. These are some of the components. I'm not, we had about 20 different tables. I'm only gonna show one, because I think this might kind of give an indication. The, the, the students loved uh, mentors, but they also loved that first year where they went into training as well as it, because it was informed by the practice, it worked well for us. And the community of practice, we wanted to make certain that they would uh, communicate and continue to communicate. Again, we provided iPads to the teachers and the mentors and others so that they could communicate. And NSF, through another grant, we went through cyber mentoring. We're still working on that. That's not totally done yet. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is a number that of our uh, return surveys that we had each year. We, when the students win their first year and second year, high return rate. When they started entering the third year and actually teachers of practice, that was a challenge. We, we already knew that it was gonna be difficult. The, uh, the mentors really returned their surveys. The uh, principals, that was, we, we just about decided that wasn't gonna be something that we were gonna invest a lot of time in because they just absolutely were not returning them at a rate that we could get meaningful material from them. So we gave, we didn't give up on it, but we changed that. Um, what are our wisdom, our wisdom of practice? Well, for us, and the key word is that we learn from the literature. We did a great literature review of everything before we got started, and we modified things to adjust to the climate in which we exist in. And so these are some of the things that we learn that you can uh, in developing partnerships. I remember I told you I work with urban systemic initiatives, and I knew that when the mayor changed, the project sometimes just lost all kind of momentum. The governors changed in statewide system, they lost. The alliances, we were able to maintain it because we had experienced what happens with leadership change. So we had a leadership structure that kept things together so that it was a team effort and not so much led by the leader in whatever unit we were dealing with. So we had established personal connections and we listened to them. The personal connections would be me meeting with superintendents, principals, or state leaders meeting and maintaining the contact. And, and we learned that they wanted to talk. They, they, had, they wanted to share their thoughts on it. And they even asked some ways in which they wanted to improve the project. The main thing that they wanted to know was this. They had such a shortage that they take every teacher we produce. They said, we want them and we'll take them after the first year. We had a struggle to keep them in the initiative long enough that they could make progress towards that MAT. We were honest with them. We told them we wanted the MAT. We wanted them to, to know that it's going to take time. And some of their teachers who were necessary while they were going through this project to be teaching 
they were going to have a tough time going through the academic and so many other workshops and things that we had. They didn't mind that. When you're dealing with this group, one of the main things that you have to do is show up. I mean, I, I, there are many times that you have to just call and say, I want you to expect us there or we're coming. We want to talk with your teachers if you're having a teacher meeting. Whatever you're doing, we want to be there. And even if we're not there, we would call whoever our contact or liaison was and we just check in to let them know we were thinking about them and that COVID and otherwise, there were things we needed to do. Uh, then we learned some other things. We have 23 school districts. We perhaps had more than 23 school districts when we started, but we learned the power of pause. That sometimes we would tell folks, look, th this is just not going to work out let, right now. It isn't timely right now. But if you give us, let, let's take a, a break and then come back and see if we can do it in a way in which it will work. Sometimes that worked. Uh, let's see how I get this down. Sometimes it didn't. Sometimes we had to say, look, you've been working with us. We've been sending you material. You haven't been replying. Your teachers seem to be doing reasonably well. So maybe this just isn't for you. Maybe we ought to move on to another. And, and that involves, of course, dealing with superintendents and principals and others. And it gets sometimes messy, but you know it's, it's necessary. And we're dealing with students. So we kept our focus on Whatever would benefit students, that's what we would do. We provided incentives. And we're still invite, providing incentives. We listen to the students themselves talk about their challenges and primarily financial, but there were other challenges that they were facing and we brought in new tools. Uh, we had uncomfortable conversations. If you're gonna have a partnership, you must, but you can't have those conversations unless you first let them know that you're honest and that you are there to assist and that you don't have another agenda. Well, uh, the research suggests that diverse teacher workforce is essential, you, you know that. Well, we think we were extremely effective in recruiting and retaining and placing uh, a, a diverse group of 120 students in high need schools that's still there. We have every reason to believe that they will stay. Research says that they will. So I'm not going to go over much of that. This was the group that, that started it all. And you have one president there and you had another president at Xavier. This is UABPB's president was with us. But we found that even when presidents left, that sometimes could make things a little different. So we wanted to build that infrastructure up so that regardless of who's leading, we still can move forward. And if we didn't mind sharing credit, we would have a pretty successful initiative. What happened? These are some of the students that we generated. If you want to go and hear from the students, you can go to mastemstars.com and click on testimonials, and you'll hear some beautiful statements, <coughs> excuse me, by many of these students talking about why they wanted to be teachers. But of course, you'll never hear one say, I want to become a teacher to become rich. But you will hear them say, I wanted to have an impact on folks' lives. I wanted to do things that would be meaningful to society. I wanted to leave something behind other than trying to see how many, how large my banking account was. And I thought that was great. Uh, this is, uh, the first is the website, second is testimonials. We got two or three videos. I have a feeling my time is up, so I won't try to play a video unless I have two or three minutes. Now I defer to the chair here. Do I have two or three minutes? Unfortunately, we're running a little bit behind, but thank That's you. That's okay. Posting. I just posted. Yeah, post you are all. And we put it in the chat too. So okay. um, hopefully folks will go and listen to those testimonials. Thank you so much, Dr. McHenry. Thank you. Um, and next we have Angelina Castaño. Thank you. Thanks, Lonnie. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, let's see if this will work. Okay. 
Yep, we see your PowerPoint. There. All right. Can you all see the slide? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's great to, to be in community with all of these other great presenters and hear about the good work. Um, my name is Angelina Castaño, and I'm a professor of educational leadership and also the director of the Institute for Native Serving Educators at Northern Arizona University. Um, and the work that I'm going to talk with you about today um, is about the Institute, um, INE, as we call it. And it's important for me to just acknowledge that although I'm here today, this work is, is really part of a team and collaborative effort, as you heard from others as well. Um, we have a great, a great set of people, which includes teacher leaders and other partners that I'll talk about. But um, the learning and the lessons that I'm going to share today, um, I, I just want to reiterate that the they're not, you know, this isn't my work. This is a collective our work. Um, and I'm I'm zooming in uh, from Flagstaff, Arizona, which is where um, Northern Arizona is, is uh, located and where I live. Flagstaff sits on the homelands of the Diné people, the Hopi people, the Havasupai people, the Wallapai people, and also the Paiute people. Um, and we're at the base of some mountains that are held sacred by 12 different Native nations. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a sense of um, where I'm coming from. Um, and this work that I'm going to talk about today is, is one of the ways that we enact our sort of collective responsibility to these nations um, and to other nations in our region. So, um, so what is the work that we do? Um, the Institute for Native Serving Educators is a collaborative initiative to strengthen schools across Indian country. Um, and it started with one particular program, which is the one that I'm going to really focus on today and is, is in the sort of top circle on this slide, the Diné Institute, which stands for the Diné Institute for Navajo Nation Educators. Um, but I wanted to share this slide just to kind of give you a broader sense of the context that um, in the past five years, we've actually grown to offer multiple different professional development programs that serve different Indigenous communities and different groups of educators within Indigenous communities. And I'm not going to talk about all of those today, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the sort of collective work. Um, all of this work is sort of grounded in a couple of, of key ideas that you'll hear throughout what I'm gonna to share today. But the main one is this notion of cultural responsiveness. Um, and so we really think about what does it mean to engage um, in, in professional growth, professional learning partnerships with educators and indigenous communities in deeply culturally responsive ways um, and in ways that really um, uh, meet community needs. And the other piece in terms of context that I think is important just to share up front is that the Institute does not sit in a college of education, which often um, professional development programs with educators sit in colleges of education. It actually sits in what's called the Office of Native American Initiatives, which reports directly to the president of our university. And it comes out of one of our key strategic priorities at the university, which is to be a, the, one of the nation's leading institutions serving indigenous communities. So I share all that because um, the broader context is important in thinking about what sort of institutional structures um, and priorities are present or not present um, to lend support to the work that we're doing. So um, I wanted to spend a minute on the why, that is why do we focus on strengthening teaching and more broadly educators, because we now also work with school counselors and school leaders, but why do we focus on strengthening teaching in schools serving indigenous youth? And the why is really foundational for what it means to cultivate and steward partnerships. Um, so I again, I wanna say this up front, this conversation is about partnerships and part of what's been important for us is to be really clear on what is the collective why? What is the shared why? And how does that collective and shared why really center um, what is most critical to the communities with whom we are in partnership? Um, and so for us, this means centering the concept of Native nation building or Native nation rebuilding. Um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but this is essentially about building capacity uh, within Indigenous communities and within Native nations, and also elevating the capacity that already exists within those communities and nations. 
And part of the reason this is important is because of the history of schooling, right, and the ways in which schools and education have been sites of assimilation and sites of colonization um, and trauma for generations for Indigenous communities, um, which has led to long-term patterned inequities um, that impact Indigenous students and the broader communities um, of which they are a part. We know though that teacher quality is one of the most impactful school-based factors on student um, learning and student experiences. And so really centering teachers as leaders. I heard someone earlier use the term teacher leaders. That's a really important concept for us too. And centering teachers as nation builders in our work has been really important. And what this does is this means that we're working with teachers and with educators to build their capacity to really engage student funds of knowledge, um, community assets, the languages, the histories, the connections to land, ceremony and culture in really meaningful ways. And this is all part of nation building um, within indigenous communities. Um, and that is really what kind of sits at the heart of what we do. Um, so what is the Diné Institute? I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to focus on just one of our partnership programs. So the one that I'm going to talk about directly is the Diné, which stands for Diné Institute for Navajo Nation Educators. And these points kind of in these blue boxes on the side of the slide kind of highlight some key aspects of this. Um, it's a teacher-led professional development approach. Um, and, and part of what's important here is that this was started um, with teachers and by teachers. So to the teachers from Kayenta, which is a small town on the Navajo Nation, actually came to NAU um, about six or seven years ago now and asked us if we would be in partnership with them to develop this institute. So the idea did not start at the university. The idea did not start with a PI or a faculty member. Um, it started from the teachers. Um, and it started from them in part because they had been experiencing a similar professional development model through the Yale National Initiative. And they were ready to bring that model home um, and develop something um, close to home so that more of their colleagues could have access to it. So this per particular model of professional development is inclusive of all content areas. Um, of course, for the purposes of NSF, we're, we're most focused on STEM uh, for many of our professional development approaches or professional development uh, foci. Teachers are in an eight month seminar. So it's a long-term commitment, right? This isn't a one or a two um, sort of workshop model, but they commit to an eight month program that's designed to increase their content knowledge, their curriculum writing skills and their cultural responsiveness. Um, what happens in these seminars is that there's a cohort of teachers, 10 to 12 teachers led by an NAU faculty member around a particular theme or content area. Um, the teachers uh, learn about this particular theme and content area for the entire eight months. They engage in reading. They go on trips together. We bring in elders to really um, explicitly center the cultural responsive, culturally responsive um, components of the topic or theme. The end sort of result is that each teacher creates what we call a curriculum unit. Um, it's sort of part research paper and that the teacher writes what is it that they've learned about this content or about this theme, and then how will they implement that in their classroom with their students. So what are the activities and the ways they will engage students, what are their student learning outcomes, what are the ways they'll assess student learning and growth. Um, a couple of key things about these curriculum units that every teacher in our program writes is that one, they're not just aligned to um, state and content standards, they also must align to the Department of Diné Education standards. And the Department of Diné Education is sort of like a state education agency, but it's through the Navajo Nation government. Um, and so they've created their own set of standards for the nation that we rely really heavily on. And then we publish all of those curriculum units on our website, and I can share that um, in the chat when I'm done talking. Um, and the idea is that this is that then becomes a sort of collective resource for educators across the Navajo Nation and beyond um, of culturally responsive teacher authored curriculum units. So this quote is just from one of the teachers in our program one year to kind of give a sense of, of how teachers talk about this work. Um, this is Ms. Marnita Chischilly, 
uh, who we've co-authored some papers with, and this is from one of those articles. And she says, and this was from one of her years in the program where she was focused on um, in a math seminar specifically, um, and more specifically a geometry-based seminar. And she said, my curriculum unit is trying to make this connection between the mathematical reasoning of geometry and the cultural aspect of Native American artistry. Rug weaving is a complex and ancient craft, which is still part of our Diné society. To most people, rug weaving appears to be a simple form of artistry, but it requires visual thinking and a sophisticated understanding of geometry. By having my students rediscover the abilities of our people in the past, they might be enticed into learning their own abilities for the future. And in the short time, I'm not able to say a whole lot more about the, what the program is because I really want to focus on what are some of the things that we learned through these partnerships and sort of some key takeaways. Um, this slide, which you all can, I know is very text heavy, but you all can look at um, later. I'm going to focus actually just for a minute on the blue oval, um, which just highlights what our partnerships are. And so you can see from that list that we are in partnership with K-12 teachers as well as university faculty. There are over 115 public school districts um, on and bordering the Navajo Nation, and we work with all of them through this partnership, plus an additional 80 um, Bureau of Indian Education schools that we work with. So teachers from any of those um, almost 200 schools can participate in the Diné uh, program. We also are in partnership with the Department of Diné Education, which I mentioned earlier is like an SEA the Arizona Department of Education, um, Office of Indian Education specifically, the university of course, and then various funders. And I think it is important to just acknowledge um, funders as stakeholders in this work too, right? Uh, because it is part of the sort of broader context of partnerships when we think about the work that we do in partnership. So a key question, how do we develop and maintain partnerships and what are sort of some kind of key design decisions the, the most important thing that I wanted to share today is that for us, partnerships are really about relationships. Um, and, and this is tied to a whole literature and a whole sort of body of work around relationality um, that comes out of indigenous scholars and the work of indigenous people um, globally about what relationality is. But when we think about partnerships between, in our case, universities, K-12 schools in Native nations and indigenous K-12 teachers, we really have to think about what does it mean to adopt a stance of humility, of deference, how do we demonstrate commitment, and how are we thinking about sustainability? Um, and when we think about relationships sort of broadly in our lives, those are some of the characteristics that that um, often are important in relationships, right? So we've really tried to think about, well, just because we're in relationship around research and around professional development, what are those core values? And we, we continuously come back to those. Some other important ideas that, that have emerged in our work um, is first that it begins with them. In our case, it begins with the teachers. And I mentioned that our program began from teachers' ideas. We have a teacher leadership team which continues to drive decision-making in our program. Um, we rely very heavily on what tribal leaders, educational leaders, and indigenous communities tell us they need. So all of those other programs I, I mentioned at the beginning of my time, those all started because folks in schools and in indigenous communities came to us and said, we heard about the Diné Institute, can you help us build something similar for our community or for our group of educators, for example, with school counselors? Um, it requires that we're present and the pandemic really um, made this a bit more difficult. Uh, so we've had to think about what does it mean to be present, um, not always in in-person ways, but in our context, uh, we work in very rural communities that cover broad geographic distances. It is important to go and to be in communities and to be in schools um, in person where possible, virtually where not possible. Listening, of course, I think we already heard about that today. Following through um, in, in the communities in which we work, there is a long history. And um, I think Lonnie mentioned something about this earlier, a long history of universities and others coming in, um, engaging in a project and then leaving. Um, we cannot do that, right? We have to think about what does it mean to follow through? 
And then of course, all of this takes time. And, and that is something that um, sometimes we think we don't have, or sometimes we don't feel as a priority from our universities, um, but to really push on the fact that these partnerships, these relationships take time to cultivate and take time to the also sustain. So I know I'm about at time. Um, so I'm gonna just super quickly talk about these three critical lessons learned. I'm not gonna go into all the detail on the next couple of slides. Um, I'm happy to follow up with folks later if you would like me to. Um, so three sort of critical lessons we've learned. One is that partnerships are never neutral. Um, so this gets into ideas about power, about context and about history and about who benefits from partnerships. And so we've really had to think about think about that very critically and very carefully and really reposition and rethink um, who's benefiting um, and who where decision making and power lie in our partnerships. The second key lesson learned is that well-being always matters. So we did not go into this um, partnership and professional development work necessarily thinking about well-being. Um, the pandemic really heightened this for us, but we were beginning to learn even before the pandemic that to really be in relation with teachers and with educators, we have to think about um, our well being, our collective well being, and what it means to cultivate and sustain relationships, what it means to care for the educators with whom we work in holistic ways. So what does it mean to be physically well, intellectually well, spiritually well, emotionally well? And how does our work together um, contribute to well-being? And that's been a really important part of um, the relational or partnership work that we've done. And then the final lesson learned, um, and I'll end here, this is where I started, is again, that native nation building should always be the goal. And so if our partnership work, our professional development work is not about building the capacity of folks in indigenous schools, then we're not doing the right work. Um, and we need to, to sort of reposition and rethink what it is we're doing. Um, and then this idea that has really sort of um, been elevated in our work with teachers is that teachers are important nation builders. Um, they have incredible capacities and assets. How do we elevate those and continue to build those at the same time? Uh, because that matters not just for them and their students, but for the broader communities um, and their nations of which they are citizens. So I'm going to stop there because I know I'm over time. Um, we have a couple of papers that get at a lot of these ideas. Um, the top one is not quite out yet, but the bottom four are, and you'll have access to these links um, um, in the chat or through these slides. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angelina. That was wonderful. So interesting to hear about everybody's work. Um, I am going to share my screen again. And I'm going to go kind of quickly because I'm going to be presenting something a little like a little bit different. I'm going to be talking about mostly focusing on the lessons learned. Um, and I'm going to tell a story about um, a friendship that was the basis for a partnership. Um, so I'm going to tell the story by talking about two different partnership experiences I've had research practice partnership. Um, the question that has driven all of my research has been this one, how do secondary mathematics teachers in urban schools learn to teach equitably and ambitiously? And I've looked at this in different contexts um, for a lot of years now. And so the first partnership I'm going to tell you about is um, one that was called the MIST partnership. It was um, looking at middle school mathematics teachers, um, but particularly the partnership was with districts. And we were um, interested in, oh, somehow my clicker is doing something weird. Okay. Um, our partnership was with districts. And um, I was tasked with studying the teachers. So these little gray happy faces are, um, the PIs who had been in this partnership for five years before I was asked to join. So then I came in and I was asked to um, look more closely at the teachers across these districts we were partnered with. 
Um, the problem was that while I definitely learned things, I was able to publish papers off of that partnership work. Um, I was not at a locus of power in that partnership. Um, sometimes I would see things happening in the classrooms or teachers would tell me some dilemmas they felt. And when I would raise it with the folks who were um, higher up in the project, um, things didn't really change. So I was put in this position where it was ostensibly a partnership, but really where the negotiations and collaborations were happening was above the locus of where my work was taking place. So it was pretty um, difficult emotionally. And if you haven't ever read Ruth Behar's The Vulnerable Observer, um, and you've had to be in a position of seeing difficult things in schools and figuring out how to manage all of that, I highly recommend it. Um, so the little wisdom out of that story is that when you are working with systems, it's important to understand the locus of the partnership and where changes are possible. Um, following up with that, um, I was a PI on another NSF project called Supporting Instructional Growth in Mathematics. Now, this partnership started because of a conversation I had with a friend, um, Daryl Young, who is a professor at Harvey Mudd College and a co-leader of a professional development organization, Math for America Los Angeles. Um, after he got promoted to professor, he and I were chatting over lunch one day and he said, Lonnie, we should do something together. I wanna to do something meaningful. And I knew that he'd been working with MFALA and I said, well, let me look at your evaluation reports and let's see if we can find a problem that we both care about. So we found a shared problem um, that the teachers that were participating in MFALA wanted more feedback on their instruction. And so that became a prompt for me to design some practice uh, some partnership work with the organization. I'm still learning things through this partnership, but I feel like I have more agency um, in, in giving feedback when there are things that I see um, in honoring the teachers and what they're telling me. And so the wisdom of practice here is that when you start with a shared problem and work together to address it, that is where a lot of meaningful work can happen. And as has been said by many of the presenters today, partnerships take trust, mutual care, mutual investment in shared problems. So I'm going to end there. I just wanted to do a real brief um, just a change of tone. I think we have about 10 minutes to answer questions. There's some that have been posed in the Q&A, but it looks like they've all been answered. Um, but if if others want to go ahead and put um, questions in the chat or in the Q&A, um, we can have our panelists respond. And, and just as a reminder too, that we will have the consultation webinar, the follow-up. Okay, it looks like we've got something uh, in the, oh. Catherine is reminding me that we got some um, questions when folks registered. Um, so how can partnerships with teachers grow into larger partnerships with schools and districts? Did anyone start their partnership with teachers specifically and then move into some of these larger scale um, partnerships that you described here? This is Angelina. I can jump in. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah, we we definitely started um, with teachers, um, and in fact, as I mentioned, teachers coming to the university and saying, "Hey, here's our vision. Here's what we want to do. Um, how can we make this happen?" So, so, a, and the one thing I guess I'll I'll say before I respond directly to the question is, it's been really important for us to keep the cent the sort of central focus on partnerships with teachers because leadership turnover in the schools where we work is very, very high. And so in order to sustain the partnerships, we have found that working with teachers who in many cases have been there 20, 30 years, 
um, has been really important. Um, but to your question about sort of how uh, starting with teachers has grown into sort of more um, systemic partnership for us, um, a couple of things. One, we relied on teacher expertise and the relationships teachers have with their leaders. And so, and we really intentionally positioned them as leaders. So for example, um, I, as the director of the program, I never went and met with a principal or a superintendent without a teacher. Um, I did not go to a school board meeting without a teacher. Um, and, and those were, I think, really important strategies and they're strategies that we continue to employ. Now, I guess the, the sort of rub maybe with that is that um, teachers are really busy. And so mm -hmm. being really mindful about um, what's being asked of them and sort of how we're, we're being respectful of their time has also been important, but uh, I'll stop there so others can respond. Thank you, Angelina. I think I'll go on to the next question. We just have probably time for one more. Um, anonymous attendee says, for those working with folks unfamiliar with constraints that schools and teachers have, scope and sequence, testing schedules, mandated curriculum, accountability pressures, et cetera, have you found language that can help such folks understand and plan to account for such constraints? You know, it's interesting. I think, so everybody that I've worked with in projects um, has, has had that knowledge going in like we've all been folks who have worked in districts ourselves at some point um but that doesn't mean it, it's not good to have that reminder from time to time right empathy is really super important and um and the school districts definitely have far more constraints than the researchers have um I think it's just really making that space in the meetings for all of the partners to again like really verbalize what their needs and priorities are from the partnership and also like what are the constraints that are going to um which is part of the the priorities right they might have like a scope and sequence that they they need to address or they have um schedules that they need to stay with whatever the things are right that that can be part of their priorities how do you fit the project within those constraints that's great, Emily. And you also had that example of brokers on your project that tried to keep those lines of communication open, which I thought was really a smart design choice. And Dr. McHenry, there was some something you described about um, knowing when to consciously uncouple, you know, that sometimes maybe partnerships don't always work, especially when as large as yours and as ambitious as yours. Do you want to say something a little bit about that? Can you unmute your microphone, please? Uh, the Once I unmuted my microphone, it was perfectly clear when it was muted. But uh, the initiative that we implemented had a clear goal, and we kept everything and everyone aligned with that goal. Since we know what we were trying to achieve, when people were not in alignment, it wasn't a difficult choice to say this is not benefiting. It was an uncomfortable discussion, but it wasn't difficult because they weren't uh, aligned with what we were trying to achieve. So there, now the big, the largest problem we had wasn't really with that. I'm certain there are people, individuals on the, uh, in the chat room that will understand that our largest challenge was trying to show how what we were doing would do two things. One, retain the teachers after the project ends, no, number two, something that would show, well, really three, academic progress of the students. Uh, the schools wanted to say, if they're certified, then they have a great teacher in the classroom, where when they did not have certified, they felt that they weren't uh, achieving what they should. And we talked a little bit about that in the video, but the, the key always was keeping the students as the focus point 
and the teachers as aligned with what would be better for the students. And, and that's where we were. I think we were relatively successful in doing that, but out time will tell how long uh, if they'll be retained. Yeah, that clarity of purpose seems really like what your kind of your core values. I heard that a lot in Angelina's presentation as well. You know, just having some a very, very clear set of principles and values that you work off of. Um, let's see, somebody asked um, if anybody knows of a youth led uh, uh, practice research practice partnership. I mentioned Michelle Fine and her work. I don't know if other folks know of um, youth led. I, I would also look in the WT Grant Foundation. Um, to see what they've funded since their focus is on youth development, I would suspect that you might find more examples there than perhaps in NSF's portfolio. You know, if Does anyone know of anything off the top of their head? I don't, but I'm also thinking about the literature around YPAR, Youth Participatory Action Research. Um, and I, I know I've read about some uh, partnerships like this that are youth-led, but I just can't think of them off the top of my head, but I know they're in that literature around YPAR. Great. And Josh, Joshua, I'm sorry, I'm saying your name wrong, Totten, um, also said that the Algebra Project had a young people's project that was youth-led. All right, friends, I think we are at time. We will be recording this. We will be sending out a follow-up uh, email with, around the consultations. And we really appreciate everybody who was able to attend today. Thank you again to all our wonderful panelists for sharing your thoughts and wisdom and experiences. We've all learned a lot from you and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.